Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Parody, uh, one of the members of the steering committee. But I have to say uh, congratulations and thanks and my admiration for Professor Manning, who has put this material together and created a, a great conference for us all. And we're all sitting here learning from each other. Uh, and so, thanks, Ken. <clears throat> We're at the end of the conference, and my dear friend and, and close friend, uh, William Uricchio, is going to be talking about uh, on the subject of the forensic citizen. Uh, and the subtitle of his talk is Learning from the Past and Preparing for the Future. I'm looking forward to this event because William is someone who thinks about these areas in media uh, continually and very creatively. Uh, he's one of the founders of the CMS program at MIT. He's also the founder of MIT's Open Documentary Lab. And he's co-authored a new volume with Kat Sizek that's uh, titled Collective Wisdom, Co-Creating Media for Equity and Justice. So it's a tremendous subject that is spot on for this conference. Um, and this publication will be launched in a couple of weeks in Amsterdam and New York. Um, William is a historian of media who revisits the histories of old media when they were new, explores interactive and participatory documentary. He writes about the past and future of television, thinks about algorithms and archives, and researches narrative in immersive and interactive settings. He's a professor of comparative media studies at MIT He's also been a professor at many other institutions uh, around the world, uh, certainly in Europe uh, and the US, including Utrecht, uh, where he holds uh, another position. Uh, he's been a, a visiting professor at uh, the Free University in Berlin, at Stockholm University, and China University of Science and Technology. Uh, He's won many awards. He's done fellowships, uh, Guggenheim fellowships, and is uh, the recipient of the Berlin Prize. Uh, and his publications include Reframing Culture, We Europeans, Media Representations, Identities, Another Media Cultures, yet another Many More Lives of Batman, and the soon to appear Collective Wisdom volume. Um, so William has been present in the media uh, research area for many, many years. Um, what's interesting is media is really one of the tremendous subjects of our time and we're beginning to see it feeding uh, a, a kind of world back to us that for many people is surprising, but it's been there for a long time. So I, I, I want to uh, welcome William and uh, ready to listen to his, uh, his presentation on the forensic citizen. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words, Jim. Um, and I have to say, it's been an amazing two days. Uh, this is kind of the, as Jim said, the, as you know, the end of the arc. I will be much shorter than promised. This will not be an hour and 15 minutes. Don't worry about that. Um, but I have to say, I've been moved by what I've heard. I mean, emotionally touched by some of it, inspired by some of it. Um, 
blown away by, by some of what I've seen. It's been a remarkable two days, and I'm really indeed honored to be here. And because this is only going to get more extended with each last person, Ken, Ken Manning, um, Ken Manning is, is an amazing figure, and I'm sure you've all gotten to see him around. He's the one person who's not been at this podium uh, for the course of the conference, but he's been behind everything that happens. Ken is a magician of making things happen while kind of sitting back and watching it play out. And I'm, I've learned a lot. I've learned uh, a lot from Ken, um, uh, precisely with this kind of thing, among other things. He's a wise man. And I'm so grateful that he had the the wisdom to pull this off, the fortitude to pull it off. It was not an easy uh, task. Uh, as you can tell, if you've been to any of our, our normal conferences, this is being done at a much higher level. And I'm, I, it's a testament to Ken's uh, ability. And also, this is, a, this is a topic that we need to address as, as fulsomely as possible. I'm also impressed by the array of the, of the speakers. I don't know that I've been recently at a conference at MIT with, all, with, with five continents represented. I mean, there are folks from Asia, Australia, Europe, South America, North America. It's, um, it's amazing. It's, a, it's not the usual siloed con con disciplinary conference that I spend my days going to. Uh, this, are, this, you know, as you guys know from having met one another, people from quite different areas, from quite different positions in the academic hierarchy and from outside it. So just to say, it's been terrific. And um, the keynotes have been, yeah. And the keynotes have been awesome. I'm intimidated. I don't usually get scared before I speak, but like after Sam and, and Alyssa, I mean, this, is, this has been a great, uh, a great series of keynotes. Okay. One last thanks, and that's to Samantha Fletcher and Tracy Jones, both of whom have teamed up. Samantha has done yeoman's work in making this, uh, the, the details. The, the, these are incredibly complex processes, as I think any of you who have done this know, and Samantha's really pulled out. And Tracy has been just a pillar of support behind it all, so thank you guys. <laughs> Bearing witness, seeking justice. Um, the conference papers, as I said, have been really inspiring, offered an array of entry points um, into the power of individuals to witness, to bear witness, to create video testimonies. Bearing witness, as we've seen in many cases, boils down to the courage of a lone individual, someone willing to stand in a tense situation, pull out the camera, and do something. Um, but seeking justice has a different dynamic. Bearing witness tends to be an individual act. It's an act where our integrity as a person, our, 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 the safety of our bodies is on the line. But justice, is tends, justice, as we usually talk about it, is more systemic. Justice is a social uh, process. It's a, there are institutions behind it. We haven't talked a lot. I mean, obviously, some papers have. But we haven't talked a lot about how to go from bearing witness to making that act of courage mean something find traction, make a difference. Um, as so many historical cases demonstrate, bearing witness by itself can be ignored, suppressed, marginalized. Um, sometimes it gets buy-in, sometimes it gets momentum. Those are the cases we know. But for every case we know, I'm willing to bet that there are hundreds that are not seen. It's an interesting study. What makes a case stick? What makes something be sticky or go viral. I don't think we necessarily have as much agency as we think in this. Um, there are th these are complex uh, configurations of power that uh, sometimes wind up in justice and in many cases wind up just with, with nothing. Um, oh yeah, here's some. Bearing witness, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the power of the phone and, and videography and the numbers are encouraging. I mean, uh, in the United States, average cell phone age is almost three years. But they still have cameras, and they're still pretty good, and they're probably high def. And penetration rate here is pretty good, something like 95%. In the rest of the world, it's not forgotten, but it's, it's, it's certainly there. Um, 
And I think the, an assumption, uh, one of the assumptions for a lot of what we've spoken about, again, not all, is that there is a truth process here, a truth-telling process. I, I use Godard's uh, reference here. But you know, as, as the work that uh, Sam Gregory has been doing at Witness and that we've been helping with some on, with deep fakes, uh, these are, uh, truth is not assured in the image. Uh, it feels good to, to think that, but I, alas, uh, not so true. Anyway, my aim in this talk is to step back and put this amazing work of seeking, uh, of, of, of bearing witness into the larger context of seeking justice. Um, and just try to look at what's in that landscape that both confuses the story or might help to accelerate its uh, presence. Spoiler alert, context can be a depressing thing because there's a lot of noise out there. All of the tools we're looking at cut both ways, at least both ways. Sometimes like they cut three or four different ways. Um, they can be, the, the technological enablements for civil good, the cell phone, can be repurposed with malice or worse, simply mundane technocratic uh, control and oppression, which we're seeing more and more of. Um, these same tools plus the same social formations can be put to highly divergent ends, as we know with disinformation campaigns. Uh, QAnon, the work happening in QAnon is uh, the, the, the forensic impulse is writ large, but what the, what the folks come up with is, is kind of frightening. So this is a complex terrain, and I just want to call that out to some extent. So if we think about the technology side, we, 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 we've celebrated, rightly celebrated, the use of cell phones for bearing witness, but we know that the state has an incredible apparatus at its disposal. Uh, armed with AI, facial recognition, you name it, and that this is growing much more pervasive. Uh, this is growing by the minute. Um, these are two very different paradigms in terms of how we witness the state as witness, its own witness, and, and we as a, you know, surveillance and surveillance, which we've heard a lot about. Um, so, they're obviously radically opposed in another sense. One is our agency and, and something we have control of, something the other is, is being done to us. That space, as I said, is growing quite quickly. Um, there's a kind of potentially commonality here, and that is in the panoptic effect, in the sense that someone is always watching. When you look at the cell phone penetration rates I just mentioned, 95% in the US, the likelihood that whatever a police officer or, or anyone else does, there's someone nearby with a the, with the camera is highly likely. So that, in a certain sense, mitigates the kind of uh, more structural presence of surveillance cameras. Um, so it's, it, all is not lost. Um, So yeah, we talked about this, the split between witness and justice. Um, the other side of it is how do we make sense of these bits, if we want to use Godard's, these, these bits of truth or these, these bits of evidence, what do we do with them? And, and Sam pointed out the importance of uh, narrative, for example. Like we need to do something with it in a way that, that, that incorporates it, that encodes it, that, that makes it part of an argument, that makes it palatable, makes sense. Um, and, it's, what you're seeing at the top frame, and we'll come back to this later, is an image from The Guardian, a two-year series they did called uh, The Counted, which they basically crowdsourced evidence of, uh, of deaths uh, at the hands of police, deaths in the United States at the hands of police. The FBI, uh, you, might, you may remember a couple of years ago, there was, uh, after George Floyd, in fact, the, the question came up, how many people die in encounters with police in America each year? And that seemed to be a question that was unanswerable. Even the Federal Bureau of Investigation did not have an answer to that question. And so the Guardian launched this project where people across the country could just send in uh, reports of this happening, and then the Guardian would vet it. They would use their journalistic apparatus to, to make sure this was, uh, uh, you know, yeah, indeed properly vetted. So a really interesting example of a journalistic organization doing something that they could never do just with their, report it, with their reporters. I mean, one or two reporters would get the, the job of counting deaths in America. So impossible task for the newspaper unless they work with the public. So this is a great example to me of a kind of, of a collaborative methodology um, that, that is, is still responsible and vetted. On the other side, we have something like the, the QAnon stories or the, uh, the 5G, you know, the, 
rotting your brain, the lizard people, you name it. There, these conspiracies that have, that have taken root in, in our internet culture that have, uh, that have fostered and, 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 and grown there, um, where people's forensic impulse is, is unleashed in ways that are really not productive. Uh, it's, a, it's a dog chasing its tail, and it's doing so with great vigor. Um, so both of these strike me as, as, as tapping, in a way, the, the forensic drive that, that, that we seem to have, that forensic itch that, that seems to pervade the race, but in radically different ways, one really productive and one really unproductive. Uh, they represent two very different epistemologies, uh, one kind of reality-based and one, one, I'm not sure what to describe it as. Um, okay. So I want to just start with surveillance. And I guess the point I want to make in the next couple of slides is simply that not, not just that surveillance is an old story, but that each new media form that's entered our, our ecosystem, our culture, has almost immediately been put to use for purposes of surveillance. And, and it's always been a double-edged uh, practice. Here you're looking at some uses of photography back in the, back in the 19th century. And, uh, uh, Bertillon, who, who, give us, who gives us fingerprints, um, his project was actually quite interesting. And he also, he was also into ear prints and nose prints, uh, not, not prints, but like images of noses, of lips, of foreheads, of physiognomy, where he was convinced that he could find traits. Now, we think of fingerprints as a unique identifier. And he thought of, for example, the ear as a unique identifier. But not so much in the sense of like, oh, we have an ear print, because you don't get those so often but rather in the sense of a predictor of a certain proclivity, a criminal proclivity, a low brow. Think of, think of villains on cheap television shows or in comic books, low brow, you know, certain kind of nose or jaw. That kind of, that kind of set of assumptions was, was kind of built into what he did. But it's also part and part, this, this kind of comes back with some of our facial recognition technologies. And it comes back in our emotion trackers with the work of uh, uh, Duchenne de Bologna, who did a lot of experiments. They're the interesting images of sort of shocking mental patients' faces. And with the, with the conceit that what, what, uh, t when the twitch occurred, when the, when the grimace would occur, that these were er states. These were like basic states of the, of, of the sets of the face. And in this particular example, he compares, he compares it to classical um, sculpture to show that these are really kind of conditions of the hu pure states of, of human affect, readable, legible from the outside. And again, if you think today of where our technologies are in terms of uh, emotion trackers, things that are judging whether you're happy or sad or potentially dangerous, there is a direct line back to some of this work. So although this happened, you know, it's, although this seems ridiculous at some level, it is very much present in some of the thinking around our, our current technologies. Um, the camera, uh, especially the coming, so the camera is developed in maybe 1830s, but film stock that is instantaneous is introduced more mid-century, 1850s, 1860s. And by around 1900, cheap, easy to process, instantaneous film was widespread. And there, were, there, was, a, there were, was a plague, uh, to use the, the period's language, a plague of Kodakers, people that used Kodak, uh, running amok through New York streets and other streets, I'm sure, taking uh, surreptitious photos of other people. Surveillance. The police, of course, also used it for surveillance. So that double edge of photography is already embedded in practices and pretty widespread, a pretty voluminous uh, amount of prose in newspapers uh, uh, complaining about this practice. And you're seeing some sort of candid, uh, a candid, a cane, a camera cane, and some of the kind of shots that might come from it. Um, this around 1900 already. So this doubleness is already in place, and this notion of surveilling seeing the world unseen. Filmmakers like Vertov will make a big deal about seeing the unseen and cap capturing reality unawares, uh, celebrating that, and ri rightly so. But it does have a difficult history. Um, television has a pre-cinematic history, going back to maybe the 1870s, 1880s, and not as a 
object, not as a working technological uh, fact, but rather as an anticipated set of desires. And these are, uh, this is from uh, Albert Robida, um, in this case, 1890. And one of the striking things in Robida is in his fulsome description of this technology called the telephonoscope. He, he really outlines a series of, of, of vignettes, of, of, of scenarios where how this thing is going to be used. And it's going to be used for news, and it's going to be used for entertainment. And, it's, and he has a whole bunch on how it's going to be used for voyeurism and surveillance, in this case, uh, voyeurism. Um, so again, this is hardwired into the imagination of a technology before it even gets off the ground, this, uh, this sense. Uh, the dystopian side of it, of course, is robustly represented in, in feature films. Um, the surveillance side of it with, with uh, Chaplin in this case. And um, yeah, OK, so gear shift. Um, Feels like I jumped a slide, but maybe I didn't. So anyway, this is to jump then to a section on this sort of forensic, this, this impulse that we have. And I'm not sure if any of you were followers, not followers, but like read on, <laughs> observe, observers of uh, QAnon. But uh, it's a really fascinating space, a deeply fascinating space. People invest hundreds of hours in terms of the kind of forensic work that went into tracking. I mean, there's like thousands of pictures of Hillary Clinton's open mouth trying to prove that she is a lizard. And um, there are some 13 million people, um, allegedly, not even allegedly. I mean, this is uh, New York Times is my source. Maybe I should have to say alleged there. That uh, that that are believers in the kind of lizard uh, takeover. So a little bit worrying, um, but it is exactly the same impulse that we use when we're trying to analyze, like, well, what happened with this with this death. What happened with this riot? And let's look at the footage and figure it out. It's that same impulse, just directed in a, in a, in a ridiculous way. Um, and it's frightening all the more because of its endorsement from the highest levels of, of, uh, of an authoritarian political party in our country. Um, yeah, I'm out of, I somehow I screwed up my slides. Oh, this was just a reminder that this, uh, th this observation, this surveillance and surveillance, I, I'm kind of, it's, it's kind of value free at some level. There is great stuff. A lot of our cultural history, our, our cultural memory comes from this. It's not a necessarily evil thing or a, or a great thing, but it's, it's a thing nevertheless. But, um, and this is just a reminder to say that the technologies we're talking about here, in, in the case of the camera, are not race neutral. Technologies have biases. And the, and the biases in photography are really striking. And, you know, striking in the sense that we can talk about black and white photography and color photography. The problem in color photography is finally sorted somewhere in the 1970s. I think it's Kodak Gold that, that is brought to the market. It's, it's reasonable with black skin. Black skin looks, tones of brown or, or, or black or are visible. They're not green or just un invisible. But Kodak markets that in the 70s as being, you know, this is a, a film stock, a color film stock that's great for dark woods, chocolate, and, and brown horses. And it's like, what? Of course, you know, of course you know what this is about. And not said, not spoken in the ads. Up until that point, and you can see that by, by the um, Shirley girl up there, this was a Kodak color, color stock reference. The Shirley girl is always white and almost always described as normal. So this kind of, OK, so you think, OK, it's the 50s, it's the 60s, maybe even the 70s. Like, forgive them their sins. But when Instagram comes into the world, it's not different. If you look at the beautifying filters in Instagram, their bias is to lighten up. Um, if you look at uh, Joey Bulamwini's uh, work here at MIT, and now I should know where she is now, and I don't. But uh, with the Algorithmic Justice League, it's remarkable work that shows the inherent, the built-in bias in these facial recognition systems, in the, in the AI systems that we're using here. So all to say, you know, we can talk about the camera and what it does, but in fact, we also have to think critically about these technologies, particularly when it comes to, um, to racial issues. Um, the, 
the shackling of, image, of images to image recognition systems, to facial recognition systems, is a really frightening step, uh, uh, one that in China has gotten quite good because now you can do it with masks and it still works. I mean, that's, that's not a lot of data to be, to be um, uh, making identity uh, uh, claims on. I'm not sure what happened to these glasses. This is an image from around 2013, and they kind of stopped appearing online. So I'm not sure it either went like covert or doesn't really work. But these are, these are little facial recognition glasses so that the police on the street can know who's who and what's what. It's, it seems unlikely, and I'm not, maybe this was just a big PR blitz they did at that time. But there is really inf interesting information coming out of the Times that's looking at the supply chain and trying to figure out, trying to assess what's the state of the game in terms of this kind of surveillance. Um, and in our own country, it's starting to get a little frightening. This, with a, you know, a moderately, I don't want to say progressive, but a moderately, a, a, right, a, a left of center mayor, and uh, this linkage of what's on your ring phone, and a ring, ring camera, and what's in your shop, linking that in real time with police cameras is, is you know, it's, it's it, Civil Liberties Union and others are, are really quite concerned about this, and rightly so. So just to say, I'm not China bashing, uh, we're just, we're trying to catch up. We're, we're doing our best. <laughs> um, and just one other side to this that's kind of curious. Later in the presentation, we'll, we'll, we'll see an image from uh, a, a Belgian artist, Dries de Porter, who takes Instagram photos and connects them to the live earth cam footage of that person posing for the footage. So that, maybe you saw this in the Times, but that, that really super looking photo, and then you see someone working for like two hours to just get the right photo. Um, so he did this, he posted it, he, you know, he's an artist, he did, does great stuff, and he, he, he put it online. And it got pulled from YouTube because EarthCam claims, they have, they have surveillance cameras all over the place, and they claim copyright. They claim, so when you walk by, you are part of the copyrighted world of EarthCam. So there's, there's the issue of, of, of governmental surveillance and governmental, the potentials for oppression, but there's also kind of a marketing part of this that's a little frightening, that your data is now part of a data set, like it or not, why, in documentary, you've always got to get people to sign releases. Here, no, they just own it. And uh, uh, so, and it's a reminder that you know Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon that Michel Foucault wrote so much about, and uh, this idea that a few guards in the center turret can control the whole prison by observation. That notion is the one you see embedded in the in the little glass bubbles on the on the ceilings of, of stores. But it's, it's really become pervasive in our culture, as I said earlier, because all of us got, have the cameras. And um, okay, the forensic urge. So what is this urge? Where does it come from? What are its cultural specificities? I have Barnum up here and Neil Harris's book, uh, Humbug. Neil Harris has a wonderful thesis on this idea of humbug. So humbug is just like, it's kind of nonsense that's, you know, fakeness in a way. And he has a book on the, the role, the, the place of humbug in 19th century, early 20th century America. It basically makes the argument that this is an incredibly important cultural characteristic of the United States. And he goes through anecdote after anecdote, Barnum is his primary case, where people love the debate. The more absurd the claim, the more passionate the debate. It's never about are you right or ultimately right, proven right or wrong. That's inconsequential, and I think so much, Trump understood this instinctively. It's the debate. Say something outrageous and let the debate follow. And people, there's, there's a kind of, it, it happens in quotes, in air quotes. People aren't really in, you know, invested in these positions, but they act as if. And it's a, it's a very curious phenomenon. It's something quite I mean, I live a lot in Europe and here. It's something I don't, you know, it's traces in Europe, but here it is indeed, and Trump is a manifestation of it, a, 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 really, um, a really profound thing. And I, I want to bring that up because it's an interesting frame to think about the forensic urge in its Americanism. There is a way here, you know, QAnon is like, they're, they're copycats in Europe, but this is the place where it's a passion. 
uh, the lizard people. I'm sure you could probably find a few believers in Europe. But here, 13 million. Um, and I think it comes, it's all with that kind of tongue in cheek, almost true, what if, um, the kind of speculative engagement with the world, but one that its main affordance is that you can dive deep, do your forensic thing, scratch that, scratch that forensic itch, find evidence here, there, and everywhere, and put it together. And that's what's so striking about the discourse online, that it's the evidentiary approach to it. It's that people are finding things, comparing them. Um, so all to say that the wisdom of the crowd is not necessarily a great thing. I mean, I've just written a book that Jim mentioned, Collective Wisdom, and it's very much about trying to co-create and work with people. But there's a, there can be a toxicity, and we know that. We know that from the witch trials, and we know it from the, the, Kennedy, the, the, the Kennedy assassination theorists, and we know it from the 9-11 folks. You know, this is a CIA plot or whatever. What is that? And how can we channel that? How can we take that impulse and drive it in a way that's productive as opposed to just kind of going off the deep end? Um, I use a, a, you know, again, I refer to the deep fake work. People are indeed spending a lot of money trying to like refine that technology and there's a lot of clunky stuff out there. But at some level, it almost doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter. And I think the Earl, Earl Morris's statement of it in, this, in the title of his book, Believing is Seeing, that believing, pre, believing determines what you see, and which goes way back to the pre-Socratics. Um, this is a pretty powerful notion that we don't see the world. We believe something, and then we find it in the world. There, is, there, are, there are people for whom that is emphatically the case. And, um, so it, 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 for me, it's, it kind of decenters the whole issue of deep fake, which is, which is a, a, of course, can be used to bolster an argument. But for a lot of people, it just doesn't matter. No matter how fake, no matter how absurd, how, how, how crude the fake, that's not the issue. It's already, you, they've already been sold on it. Um, and this is a really good example to me. Uh, Bar Barbie's book um, is, looks at the, for example, the Zapruder film, as, you know, I'm a film historian from, from House Out. The, this is prob probably the, the three minutes of the most analyzed, more people have analyzed this footage and seen more different things in it than just about anything. The closer you look, the more strange things you find. It's like, how does that work? And she, docu she documents this, and it really is a great example of different belief systems coming to bear on a piece of evidence. And in fact, the evidence ultimately supporting all of it or not supporting any of it. But it, it, it's about a kind of epistemological break. And that break, which was kind of there already when you know, in the 60s uh, that, that Heather talked about uh, kind of being a little more pronounced at the end of the 60s, is in full, uh, full flame right now. Um, Social media have obviously given, if we think back when Kennedy was around, I mean, we're talking a, a bit like in the, in the late 60s with Heather's talk, uh, a, a world with very limited outlets, with more, more just you know, filtering is an issue, choice is an issue, three main broadcasters. But what's fundamentally an issue is temporality. Yes, there's live TV, but precious little. Yes, there's live TV, but easy to circumvent, as Heather showed us. Um, with these media forms, temporality is everything, as is the spread. So it's the spread, the breaking down of filters, but also the fact that instantaneity is possible um, is really one of, the, one of the things that's really changed the condition. So that the kind of accumulated, inherited wisdom we have in media studies that's kind of coming from photography through film to television breaks at this point because the, I, th I think the temporal, the, the, the shift in temporal conditions is, is simply profound. Um, so, okay. Yeah. And if you, if you haven't seen this book and you're up for like a good page turner read, it's, 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 it's a fun book and it's a scary book. It's written, I want to say in 2014. And I, I'd only read it like last week, but I can't imagine being surprised by the Ukrainian situation if I'd read this book earlier. And it's, it's, it's by a, a, a documentary producer, uh, Russian-born, British-bred, 
goes back to Russia after the, after the fall, after the end of the Soviet Union, is a hotshot because he's, he's perceived as English, and basically kind of walks us through a number of his investigative stories. And the ecosystem and the structure, the, the hard wiring of disinformation in that world, which is very much part of our world here, and more and more of it, social media really, really facilitates this to some extent. Um, it's, it's quite a useful, it's quite a useful um, read. But anyway, just to say, given that epistemological uncertainty that I referred to earlier, given that, that, that forensic drive, this on top of it just kind of leads to a trifecta of confusion. Uh, yeah, a trifecta of confusion, there it is, okay. Um, okay, so gloom and doom, sorry, let's switch to like how can, what the hell can we do? How can we, I'm gonna be very pragmatic here. Sam gave us a lot of like forward looking, you know, like let's think about getting in there at the standards level as new technologies are emerging and making sure this won't come back to bite us. I'm gonna be like really next couple of years, next five years uh, in look. But I think there's some great examples. I will tell you right at the outset, again, Sam, I'm gonna abuse your name up here. There is a, there is a issue of equity here. There is a, this is something the, first world can do in a way that a lot of other parts of the world can't. Um, and we have to find ways to fix that. And we have to find ways to even make what I'm showing you now more, more vigorous, but let's get going. Um, you know, how to go from witnessing to justice. That's the, that's the key question. I just wanna start with this, this point back to the 1930s, this wonderful project, a couple of, uh, Former Cambridge University students got together and started this, this amazing project to document everyday life in Britain. And they got, I don't know, a couple hundred people involved to keep diaries. And what's interesting about this project is that it was a bottom-up project. Uh, there was not government funding. This was like, hey, cool idea. Let's look around. World is changing fast. Let's figure it out. Led to a number of policy changes ranging from the kinds of posters that the, 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 the British were using to you know, in the warm up to World War II, to the to tax uh, policy, uh, which started to change as a result of better understanding, better insights into the lives of the ordinary people. So this was a really inspiring project. It kind of comes and goes, it still exists in a way, but just to say that this kind of surveillance meets surveillance can happen if there's a structure, if there's a framework. Um, one historical precedent, the arts are another great piece. This is the, the Dries de Porter piece that I mentioned where you see the Instagram shot and the posing. <laughs> the <laughs> I always wondered what that was. I've seen these people on the streets kind of dancing around and now I think I better understand it. The arts, a great way to interrogate this space. And I'm not gonna go into the arts. I'm gonna go into really pragmatic ways to use this footage, to take this testimony and to do something with it. So it's gonna really boil down to a couple of things like NGOs and, and, and Sam, Sam's talk was a real inspiration in that regard. Witness does great work and it's 30 years of great work and it's, it's great work in terms of like on the, on the ground like documentation as well as thinking ahead and, and figuring out what's coming down, uh, down the pike. Um, it's something that the folks in Amsterdam in, uh, with Bellingcat do in a really wonderful way. I was surprised to find the National Post Lottery as <laughs> one of their funding sources. God bless the Dutch. Um, they do remarkable investigative stories. Again, using, you know, using open source material, using open source intelligence, really working with any material they can find in highly creative ways to sort of document what seems to be undocumentable for uh, sometimes the mainstream press and certainly for some governments. So NGOs are, a some NGOs are proving to be a place of real important activity in terms of being an interface between stuff that's on the streets and things that turn into reports or finally get into the courts or you know, finally make it to the press. Um, yeah, open source intelligence, okay. The press is another really terrific place. Alas, these examples in the press are rare. So the Guardian is a newspaper I love, but these kinds of collaborative examples, this is a little bit more information on the counted, are, are alas, few and far between. But here what they basically did for a two year period was, was sort of document um, these deaths and you could, get a, you could get a little 
you know, if you click on one of these images, you'll get this little blow up with the story, the documentation. Um, there was a, an interface where you can slice it and dice it by the age of the victim, whether they had a weapon or not, how they died. There was a surprising number of people died by tasers, like something like 20%, 25%. I was really quite surprised by that. Uh, by state, by race, by, by whatever. So this is a very interesting tool, but it's also kind of a narrative. It's a narrative that you can, con you can construct your own narrative by working with this data. Um, and a really, a really noble uh, initiative and a, a sign that this kind of collaboration between us and them, between us, we in the streets and the folks that, that work in the newspapers, it can happen. It's a great example of it. Alas, as I said, there aren't a lot. Uh, the Times, obviously, and you know, other newspapers have been doing good work lately. Again, using videos, using citizen-produced video, and then, and then analyzing, really, really working with that, and working with, in this case, it's a lot of found material from the internet, some of the analysis, working with that and then bringing it to a bigger public. So there's some, this is a thing they've, I think the Times is doing a bit more regularly. Um, but it seems to me this is a space we really need to think more about. How can we come up with more robust forms of collaborative journalism, working with the kind of credentialed, respectable, responsible press, but in a way that takes, that makes use, that does things the press can't do alone, and, and does it in a way that verifies the work we're doing on the ground. Takes testimony, turns it into justice. Even as we speak, there's a, our, our dean, Melissa, our former dean, and now, and now um, chancellor, Melissa Nobles, with uh, her, her good buddy, uh, Margaret Burnham. Margaret has a new book out. This is a long-term project over at Northeastern, where year after year, law students uh, were sent, uh, went to, I think over their Christmas breaks or whatever, they went south. And they would try to find cold cases, cases from the 20s, the 30s, 40s, year after year, and a database started to accrete of mostly black men who died in mysterious ways, uh, disappeared. There was one streetcar that I remember here, that one streetcar line that, I don't know, like seven or eight men never made it, got on and never made it off. And you only start to see these patterns when you can go through huge data sets. So by throwing this army of lost, you know, Tr lawyers in training loose on these data sets, uh, they were able, A, to find a lot of, um, I mean, patterns that are pretty shocking, B, to learn methodologically that you never try to work with the local courts or the local police. Like, that leads to parking tickets, arrests, uh, you know, no information. But if you try, you know, and the, the, she's outlined, she and her students have outlined the ways that do work, so all to say, it's, it's turned into this book. They also have a database behind it. That's what's on the other side. And it's being presented right now, the book launch. Um, but this is a really, really important project. And again, a sign of what, OK, we've talked about NGOs. We've talked about the press. In this case, what universities can do. Universities can do powerful things um, because A, they're training the future. But B, that process of training can also be an, a data aggregator and a data analyzer a way to turn witness into justice. This is uh, Goldsmiths. Forensic architecture is an amazing, if you don't know these people, you should. They do incredible work, uh, really incredible work, and transformative work. And it always shocks me that this is a lab at a university. Um, so again, they're working with all kinds of data sets creatively. They're working, they're, they're definitely going against the wind, against the, against the waves. They're going against a lot of vested interests to come up with the stories uh, they do. Their reporting on Israel has, has, has really been quite good, uh, among many other stories. So just to say, this is, a, if, you, if you don't know them, keep an eye out for them. Uh, but it's a university. And finally, I'll, I'll point to the, the, the project we did, where it's, the, you know, it's just about to come out. It'll be out start in November. But the, the idea of co-creation is to try to build trust and to try to, to try to harness the power of people by working with them, not trying to do things for them, not doing things about them, but working with them. And in so doing, trying to build relationships, trying to build trust, uh, trying to establish credibility. And so we've been, this is based on a lot of field work, on tons of interviews. 
But you know, we have sites, field work sites, like in, in Kentucky. We have a couple of different sites in rural Kentucky where we're trying to work with unemployed coal miners or folks in the, in the rural outback to figure out how these communities can, can, you know, what are their needs? And why did their newspapers disappear? What, what are their news sources? What do they want? How can, how, can, how can we imagine together ways, how can we leverage our brand and our, the stuff that we as MIT can, can help in a situation with what they want? And how can we make that happen together? So there have been a bunch of different um, endeavors here to, to try, again, to leverage the power of individuals from witnessing to doing something bigger systemically on the level of trying to achieve justice. Um, so yeah, the, 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 there's a tension, I think, that just to summarize, you know, between the kind of applications of the technology on the one hand and the kind of investigative drive and also narrative frames that we're giving to it. And, and to me, these are the key questions. You know, how do we, how do we, um, how do we imbue our media practices with ethics? Ethics, it's a, it's a funny, eth ethics is a, philosophy departments started to fade in our universities. Ethics were kind of the first thing to go. They get trotted out as, as ornaments, as Google has shown us so, so sadly. Um, but I think we have to think of media practice and ethics in the same, in the same breath. Um, it is, it's inherent, and maybe it's like even stupid to say it here, when you're talking about witnessing ethics are kind of part of the job. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, you know, and how do, we, how do we direct this energy in a way that's productive and not just psychotic? Psychotic means broken from the world. It means deluded. And, and again, we, have, we inhabit this moment of a kind of epistemological rupture. It really doesn't matter what you say sometimes because it just won't be heard and we have to find a way to suture that. So that's why I'm focusing on these kind of mainstream organizations. Again, admittedly, this is all kind of, it's very tangible, concrete. But everyone, everyone you know, I'm sure Witness can use more money and, and more boots on the ground, and I, for sure, the newspapers can use a lot more creative thinking in terms of working with communities, not just talking about communities or selling newspapers to communities. And universities need to do a much better job of not just, you know, of getting out of the tower and trying to interface with the world, uh, partner with our communities, and make a difference. So that's, I think, it. Thank you. We have time for a couple, couple sure. of questions. Sure, sure, sure. We have time for a couple of questions, if anybody if you've got any energy left after all this uh, two days of two intense days. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so we are talking about these collaborations between like press university, um, other institutions, NGOs, and the communities. This is at a time that in the US and in some parts of Europe, the trust in almost all of these institutions is at all time low, right? And we see that um, a lot of times people get to those spaces like QAnon when they see one lie by political institutions and then that lie leads them, for example, to a YouTube video that they see it, and then they just go down that rabbit hole of algorithm suggesting them. That's like, oh, you're interested in these lies? Let me show you more. And then they suddenly become even like flat earther. It's so easy to go down that rabbit hole. So, and then like in academia, we have the problem of class, right? That there, there are reports that increasingly the faculty of humanities are coming from upper middle class, upper class, and their interests and their concerns don't necessarily align with working class, lower middle class. So I'm wondering that there's a lot of work that, and then the, of course the issue of press that is owned by corporations, the vast majority of them. So what can all of the, what, how can we even reimagine first the institutions from universities to press and all these political institutions and the algorithms and platforms so that we gain that trust again so that we can work 
together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I think it's about what I've shown here are hints, uh, be, be, because The Guardian doesn't do this very often. They've done it, as far as I know, once you know, for a two-year period, sustained and, and important. Uh, they've done some other interesting projects, but, but basically they don't do a lot. There are not outlets for people to sort of put their forensic imagination, their, their forensic impulse to work. There aren't, there aren't outlets. The right actually provides a fair amount of like, you get a lot of feedback from your peers and, you, and off you go. What are, we, what are the sort of normal people, the normies doing? You know, we don't really have those opportunities so much. So when I look at just the, the couple, these couple of examples, like I think they need to be much more visible. There, have, there need to be outlets Rebuilding community is central to all of this, I think. It's, um, that's fallen away a little bit, and uh, I'm not going to point at social media, but it's one of, one of the factors in there, exacerbated by things like COVID, whatever, most recently, but in the making for a while. So, so I think, you know, like a very different, I mean, a pie in the sky, very different notion of how we arrange our politics so that the, the local matters a lot more, and it's not just this kind of crazy national media game when, in fact, the realities are all local. Republicans seem to understand this. So for example, a lot of the focus on school boards in this country has been a really, I think, quite interesting and effective tactic to sort of, to galvanize people's energy, to galvanize their desire to have some kind of community interaction and dig in and, and fight for a cause. Okay, in a reprehensible way, but what's the other side doing? And it's nothing. So I think part of the problem is a void uh, in terms of a, a place for people to put to work what they're worried about, what their concerns are. Uh, that's not a good answer. And, and, it's a, and obviously, step out of this cultural frame, and it gets complicated in all kinds of other ways. Um, yeah, not a great answer, but. So going off of, of the last question, and I'm thinking about what institutes like MIT can do to partner with schools. We were just in there with the high school students to have them thinking about collaboration um, in a way that it feeds into this pipeline when we're thinking about ethics. Like you said, that's not something that's being learned in the classroom now, but how do we bridge that gap? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so th thank you. And, and I think there are incredible opportunities for example, no one knows neighborhoods better than the folks who live there. And we live in a media era. There's a lot of new tech out there that, that, that people want to learn about. How can we, you know, one way is to sort of have, have local, work with high schools to have training about, let's just pick something arbitrarily, um, augmented reality. Okay, hip, cool, whatever. If I think of Somerville where, where um, I live here, Every intersection has a name on it, like the, 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 the Sergeant McKinley Square. Like, who the hell is Sergeant McKinley? And there's a, there's a well, probably someone, maybe someone interesting or not, but that's a story that's a researchable story. But more, even more interesting is how did Sergeant McKinley's name get to be there? Whose name isn't there? What's the pattern of names? Those are, those are very easy to research things and very easy to geolocate data. So you're teaching kids the technology, you're teaching them the research skills to, to kind of figure out how this happened in City Hall, who decided this name and not that name, what was that process? And you're giving them kind of look at how the power works and like what do we need to do to fix it? Really hyper-local, really, but, but fun, you know, fun. I mean, I, I haven't worked with young kids that much, but I get the sense, like the kind of stuff I talk about in the classroom is probably not gonna be interesting, but this hands-on stuff might be a little more. So that kind of, I think, take advantage of the place where you are. And so much of, I mean, not so much, but there are, there are really a number of elements of what happens at MIT that are completely relevant for the neighborhoods and where we can, where we can learn from the community. Um, MIT is better than a lot of institutions, I would say, um, at least the ones I've worked at, but it, there's a lot more we can do. And, um, Other questions? Uh, certainly conferences like this make a difference. Yeah. Because conferences like this don't just bring academics together. They bring a lot of different people from different walks of life, including different ages. 
So if we have a direction to pursue, it's to strengthen the offerings of these kinds of, uh, of, organi of groups meeting like this and you know, talking about some of these issues and publicizing them. Other questions? Hi, William. Uh, <coughs> thank you for your talk. Amazing, as always. I have a question about, OK, so what do you think about using surveillance, right? Ignite people, uh, but then how surveillance, like, you know, like how the community then start to feel like paranoid and, you know, like creating, I guess, like I will tell you in the case of the delivery workers, right? In, in the case of? The delivery workers, the work that I'm using, yeah? So they are, uh, you know, like reporting uh, when they see someone that potentially could be a thief, right? But then, and that started because they had a problem, right? And they started building community. But this, I'm starting to see that it's becoming a problem because now they are seeing, you know, a target in different people and they are like targeting people that might not be, you know, like thieves. So I'm just wondering like, yeah, it is important so is valiance and also like in igniting, you know, like um, the community, but then it has like a backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Or like a like another problem that I'm starting to see mm -hmm. with this community. And I, I was just wondering if you have any, like have you thought about it or, yeah? Yeah, so I guess I've thought about it in the sense that these are always double-edged, at least yeah. double-edged uh, technologies and, and applications. And I think I, I kind of want to, part of me, the hopeful part of me wants to say we're in this transition period. We know that we have, we know that the surveillance, the state, you know, the kind of, number of cameras are, are rapidly increasing, that that side is there. We know that. For me, the surveillance side is an interesting counter force, a counterbalance. Um, and I wonder, I, part of me wonders like, so what was the public before any of this? I see you, you see me, I see everyone around me, everyone around me sees me. Like there was, we, we, we had kind of equal access to one another. The game is a little upsided now, especially with facial recognition technologies and all that stuff that we're never really going to get the same way the state gets. But I wonder if we're not just in a kind of, hopefully if we're in a kind of transition that when we, when we all are armed with these things, we all have the ability to watch each other, like maybe we'll, it'll, either we'll get accustomed to it and get over it or kind of figure out that like we're as vulnerable as we are offensive, so let's just be cool. Again, not a great answer. I, I, I'm just hopeful that it's a transition, a cultural transition moment. But, um, but you know, it's inherent. It's inherent, and it's been inherent in these technologies from the get-go. And as I showed with photography around 1900, that double-edgedness is there. And um, yeah. Oh, okay, Sam. Yeah. Uh, William, this, this has been an incredible conference in terms of the range of discussion. It's been, I wish I'd brought all of Witness's 45 colleagues here. Uh, a lot of them have been live streaming in, so just uh, really appreciate it. I, I want to ask a question that is around the link between the kind of forensic impulse and media literacy, because I think the two get, and I'm thinking about Dana Boyd talking about media literacy as this rabbit hole where you kind of clamber down of trying to unpick everything and you end up unpicking it <coughs> to the extent that it you, you can't make sense of it. So I'm, and often in the work of witness, we hear people talking about, you know, doing the type of stuff that a Bellingcat does or a reverse image search as part of media literacy. Um, and it's sort of like plugging in these technologies, plugging in this forensic impulse into an idea of how citizens should use their literacies. And it, so I, I guess the question is really just like, what is the relationship you see between more broad-based consumer media literacies and this forensic turn, and how do we manage that without it becoming this kind of impulse to deconstruct the media until it means nothing? Yeah, great question, and it echoes, uh, it goes briefly back to Jim's opening comment about just how, how important the media are in our lives, and how little we attend critically to them uh, institutionally. So at a place like this, we a lot goes into like making the chips and figuring out the latest you know, the liquid lens and you name it but not a lot into the kind of critical assessment. I mean, I think our program is, is probably it, and it's not a big program, and it's not a well-funded program. 
And it seems to me fund it's fundamental. And it's certainly fundamental on, 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 on you. So I'm a huge advocate of media literacy. And I think, I think it's a really potentially useful way to kind of, to kind of put into context the, the kind of uses and abuses of the, the, of, of, uh, of the forensic impulse in this regard. Because you can make this, you can call this stuff out to be as ridiculous as it is if you really just take two steps back. If you're self-taught, and if you, this is your entree into the world of, of media literacy, your friends have showed you how to do the blow up, and you figured out how to freeze the frame, and like that's, that's learning, and it's progress. And I understand the attraction of that, and, and you're, you're going down the algorithmic, uh, the algorithmic, the hole that the algorithm has dug for you, that's incredibly precarious. So yes, some way of standardizing and teaching, like the, bringing, bringing media liter literacy to much higher levels is, is fundamental. And, um, and I, I just, it's absence from the curricula, whether, whether basic school, high school, university, it's, it's absence is, in this era, with the speed of trans transformation of our media forms, just strikes me as not only irresponsible, but like willful, like it is, it is willfully absent. When we've pressed on, we pressed on it hard here for the maybe first 10 years of this program. Um, so let's say from 2000 to 2010, really worked hard to get it in the schools. MacArthur Foundation, a lot of money to back it, like millions to, to do it. And the basic, the resistance was so mundane, it was kind of shocking. Well, there aren't enough hours in the day with the curriculum, or state's testing standards like preclude any new curricular material. It was that kind of very mundane blockage. Um, but it persists. And it's stunning and it's precarious. We look at the you look at the political situation in this nation, and not just this nation. It's it's endangering our futures to be ignorant about this, or to be self-taught in a kind of half-assed way, um, that that has certain affordances and certain set, brings set, certain satisfactions, but also is really dangerous. So yeah, thanks thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Thanks very much. This what a brilliant conference. I think one more word is going to be said, but but thank you all. It's really uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Um, let me just introduce Eric, Eric Klopper. Um, Eric Klopper, professor in uh, the comparative media studies and writing, head of our department, and maybe even head of I think head of literature as Correct. well. This guy wears has two heads, so be careful. I, I will be brief. Um, thank you, William. Um, that was wonderful. Um, I'll be brief. As I know, uh, I, like all of you, um, drank from the fire hose, as we say here at MIT, for the last couple days. I mean, I think this was both a sort of intellectual um, fire hose, um, but it was also an emotional fire hose as well. And so I feel, I feel that, um, I feel that in my head. Um, uh, and, and through that through that process, I've I've learned something. I've learned a lot of things actually, and I, and I've changed um, in the last couple of days. Um, and as I, I think about bearing witness, my definitions of that have changed uh, somewhat. I think about it as a more active process, a more dynamic global process, and, and one even more under threat than I thought before. Um, but I, I reflected actually on the on the title of the event, and particularly apropos to the to the last question here. Um, you know, the, the 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 subtitle of the event is "Videography in the Hands of the People." Um, but I also think about this and learned about this as video in the hands of the people. Um, it's about what happens to that video also when it gets out into the world and becomes viewed by people. Um, and while the videographer is paramount to this to this uh, to this effort, um, so are all the viewers um, who do something with that with that video when it gets in their hands. Um, and I think that responsibility is increasing um, for the viewers um, as um, authoritarianism, racism, other forms of social injustice um, remain or, be, or increase in their pervasiveness. Um, and technology, while it provides um, an avenue to, to bearing witness, it also provides additional challenges to bearing witness. I mean, so I think about the kinds of responsibilities that we as an institution here at MIT have um, for helping with that. Um, and it's about, it's about education, it's about having events like this, and it's about, it's about the collaboration that, that, that also was just previously talked about as well. Um, and so I certainly think about more doing, a, a, as a department, as an institution, about doing more events like this, about making more of an impact in this area, and extending the mission of, of, our, of our unit as well. So with that, um, I will I'll have a, a number of thanks to give here. Um, I'd like to thank Philip Alexander, um, our provost, Cindy Barnhart, um, Mauricio Cordero, um, Richard Duffy, Fox Harrell, Robin Palazzo, 
uh, our Dean Augustine Rio, who you heard at the beginning, and Andrew Whitaker. Um, I do want to also call out the, the entire uh, conference committee here, uh, many of whom are still in the room with us uh, right now. Uh, Michelle DeGraff, um, John DeFava, Renee Green, uh, Tracy Jones, Nicole Harris, Heather Hendershot, Caesar McDowell, uh, Ken Manning, uh, Chakanesta Mubunga, Jim, Jim Parody, Justin Reich, Andrew Turco, uh, William Murkio, and Sulafa Zudani. Um, and I'd like to especially call out um, Tracy. I, is she still here somewhere? Tr Tracy, right there. <laughs> Tracy Jones, um, Samantha Fletcher, who is also here in the back. Samantha Fletcher, who really sort of, sort of some of the muscle behind these <laughs> events. And, and I will add my special thanks to Ken Manning. Um, as, as, as William, as, as, William I, as William mentioned, um, you would think that in, in, an, in a place like MIT um, that this kind of event would be easy to put on. It's a necessary event. It's the right place for an event like this. And yet, it is not an easy effort to get an event like this produced and, and, and funded and, and, and underway. Um, and Ken was tireless in making this happen. Um, and he really deserves a tremendous amount of credit for that. And I see, I see um, a satisfaction in his eye as, as, he was, as he was at the conference. And it's not in himself and his, and his accomplishments, because that's not who he is. It was about the accomplishments and the success of everybody who came on these stages and spoke and spoke the truth and made a difference. Um, and for that, for bringing all those people together, I give Ken a great deal of gratitude. So thank you. Thank you.